We're on our website is corpskeptics.org. We try and, and we're on Facebook as well and Twitter. So you know we always try and find if there's any kind of news item that skeptics might be interested in, just uh, take a look there. We're always making uh, updates. Okay, so that's it. Um, the next our speaker tonight is um, is somebody who has an amazing story to tell, uh, an amazing experience, a frightening experience in many ways. Um, about uh, getting involved in an organisation that, that really, over time, just sucked you in to their world and created a complete um, alternative universe in some ways um, that uh, uh, saw, um, saw, saw, you know, that, that kind of, it's amazing in some ways that we've got, we, we have organisations like that, that they have so much power over people over a, over a long period of time. You hear an awful lot about it and, and the organisation itself has been going through a lot of turmoil in more recent years as people have um, started to defect and started to basically get out of the organisation and tell their stories. And uh, John J Dignan here um, has, is one of those people who came at hand and has a real story to tell and has written a book about his experiences that I definitely <coughs> encourage uh, everybody to, to, uh, to, to read. So I won't say any more. You're probably sick of me standing up here and blathering on. Um, could you please put your hands together for John Dignan? Great. Um, what I'm going to do is, um, I am a journalist. Um, my plan is I'm just going to run through roughly a 20 minute general, I suppose, um, sense of where I, how I got in Scientology and how I got out of it. I'm also going to talk, I'm going to be quite general, there's a number of broad things I want to talk about because I constantly, as you can imagine, ask myself, how the hell did I end up in that place? You know, uh, and I still puzzle over that. Why did I end up in a cult for 22 years? So, um, that's kind of what I'll do, but I'll we'll, 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 we'll speak for about 20 minutes on this and prepared thing I've done. Then I'll open up the floor for questions. And we can talk as long as you want. But, uh, you know, as long as you're willing to stay, as long as you keep the place open, we'll chat away. I'm quite happy to do that. So, I suppose to open up, um, I'm just going to, I've got a couple of just little pictures there that I thought might be of interest. Um, that's Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I'm sure as you know. That is um, Pope Pius, the first or second or third, whatever he was, right? right. Um, yes, yeah, sorry, he's hanging out with a fellow called um, Adolf Hitler there. Um, just for the sake of balance and for the sake of, you know, uh, you know I am doing due respect to all religions, so it puts a uh, movement there as well. Um, I don't know exactly what it's called. This guy called Alan Hubbard, who I'm talking about in specific. Okay, so first of all, I must express my thanks to, um, to Colin and Alan um, for inviting me here to give, um, to give this, this talk. Um, I don't really have any skeptic credentials to speak of. Rather, it could be argued that the accumulation of my life experience attests to just how desperate, I suppose, society's cry, society's crying out for the skeptic thing. Now, apropos of something you might want to take home with you, um, Erza, uh, Ezra Pound said that a, a general loathing of a gang or a sect usually has some sound basis in instinct. Um, which, again, that's a quote I've kind of kept with me for, uh, for many, many years now since I've got the cult, really, right? If you're suspicious of it, there's probably something quite dodgy about it, right? But even more pertinent to this evening's discussion, there was a fellow on a, a message board that I used to do quite a lot of communicating on, who said that, um, apropos Scientology, he said, I joined a religion started by a science fiction writer that used a double cross as its symbol, and then they tried to sell me a bridge. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> now, all I would decide this was really, um, now I hope that uh, none of you ever doubt the validity of skepticism, right? Um, it's a strong and it's an enlightened position. But I also hope that you never lose sight of the living hell that so many of those who feel compelled 
to allow the subject, sorry, to allow the abject dissolution of self-respect and the subjugation of free thought and pride and courage that so many religious sects demand um, of the converted supplicant. Um, I suppose I, agree, I agree with uh, Dawkins and Hitchens' statement that um, religious conviction should be challenged. But equally, I feel that the more enlightened stance requires a greater burden of compassion toward the um, delusional believer. Um, I suppose I stand here and I regret the circumstances that and the conditioning that resulted in my endless, I suppose, an exhausting addiction to the formal and ultimately empty promise of the all-encompassing faith in an interventionist Godhead, uh, and ultimately in a, an eternal hereafter that in whatever blissful configuration the, this was the, the, the unique selling point of the religious brand in question might have been trying to push on me. I suppose I was a, I think I was a religious junkie. Um, I got, probably got the same fix from the smarmy religious pushers that others might get from that kind of insulated, cotton wool, all-encompassing um, sense of security that the junkie might get from injecting heroin. Um, and that might sound a bit silly, but it's actually something I something I, I feel very strongly about. Um, it is an addiction, uh, for me anyway. Uh, maybe my circumstances in my childhood led me to being that vulnerable that I needed this kind of um, fix, I suppose, really. Now, I don't dismiss all people of, uh, of religious persuasion, though. Um, I don't even dismiss all theologies. I'm a great admirer of Dietrich Bonhoeffer as well, and, you know, go back to him there. Um, now, his religious conviction was less that of a, I think it was more, less of a conviction, but it was more of a internalized compassion. It was a personal humanitarian imperative to face up to and tackle evil um, as it manifested in reality. Um, thus, unlike, say, the same period as Bruno Bonhoeffer, we have there's Pope Pius who made a deal with the devil, so to speak, um, as did various other religious leaders. <coughs> the, um, so unlike those fellows I showed you there, he was executed, he was executed just before the war's end, really, um, because of what he believed and because of I suppose it was that internalized humanitarianism really that, that, sort of, that, 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 that allowed him to um, um, yeah, the, the, uh, I suppose it kind of allowed him to um, that expression of, of, of faith really. Um, now I can't help thinking though that um, he merely filtered his humanity and his moral imperatives through the complex and the devitalizing matrix of his Lutheran faith. But maybe that is just my, my own prejudice coming into play. Now, if you give me, I beg your patience here now. I, I'm working from, um, from the general toward this specific, okay, so I, I will eventually get to the story in question, right? Um, now, recently some evangelical Christians were out to save me recently, right? Now, they used an argument that centered on the fact that there are apparently millions of levels of perception, sound perception, light perception, that, can, that we cannot pick up. Um, and I suppose the idea that they were trying to put across to me there was that, you know, that God and his opposing binary Satan existed in these levels of perception that are beyond our, you know, beyond our ability to see or whatever, right? But I suppose um, my answer to that, not at that point, obviously, is that kind of awful thing, you know, where after, you know, you, someone's giving you an argument and you get upset about the argument and then you're on the, on the landing afterwards, you know, oh God, I should have said that. I, 
I suppose what, what I thought about afterwards, what I should have said was that um, there are an awful lot of dimensions that I can see. Um, one of them, of course, is the bottom of the, uh, of the Cayman Trench in the Caribbean Sea. Another, of course, is on the tip of Mount Everest. I, I've never been there. Um, I'm never going to be in those places. Um, but that doesn't affect me. You know, there might be life forms up there, there might be, you know, I don't know, the microbes and little animals or whatever else up there, but they don't affect me, and they don't care about me, I don't care about them, they, you know, they exist, right? Um, I, I don't necessarily believe in them, they don't necessarily believe in me. Um, I suppose I live in this world now, and this is the thing that, 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 that uh, I want to get across to religious people, um, my previous fanatical religious experiences tried to get me to look into the unknowable other dimensions and, as in the Scientology case, despite their duplicitous claims, they tried to get me to live anywhere but in the present. Um, once you look into Scientology a little bit, you'll find that Scientology says that the humankind is hypnotized. This is one of the key things that they try and sell you. The humankind isn't existing in the present. He's stuck in somewhere in the past, right? Um, but what happens in Scientology is that they actually take you out of the present. They, 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 they stick you in some kind of a neurotic anxiety, I suppose, really, about, about your spiritual and mental condition. That's, again, it's, it's a little bit complicated to explain, but. That is what they do. So you're, you're in this endless anxiety about your existence here on this earth and your uh, relationship to humankind. Things you take for granted all of a sudden are kind of undermined and brought into question. Um, and it's not very healthy. Um, so I lived that for 22 years, I'm 45 years of age. I had all the qualifications of a secondary school dropout. Um, I had an awful lot of experiences that I could do nothing with. I had to eat. I had to house myself. There was no God, or no gods did not come and intervene to help me at that point. What did help me, I suppose, really was the intervention of science-based, peer-tested psychology, sociology, and language. Um, I had a chaotic childhood. I grew up in a severely economically, educationally, and socially deprived, yet very deeply religious family. It was an utterly dysfunctional experience. Um, answers to problems were sought in God and prayer. Now, we were, we were Catholics. We were very extreme Catholics, actually. That was, that was the upbringing. Um, but my, uh, my father happened to be, later on, he was diagnosed as a well, Post, post his death, he was diagnosed as bipolar. Um, the, 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 he was constantly up and down. He couldn't, you could never trust what he was going to say or do next. He could be this wonderful father, full of fun, taking the kids out, and the next could be a complete monster. Um, so it was a little bit destabilizing for a child growing up. Um, now he took his own life. Um, I, was, I was about maybe, I think I was 10 years old when he took his own life. Um, he left behind him a wife and six kids, completely destitute. Actually, we were more destitute than we already were. Now, six months later, my mother died. Um, now, I have since looking at it, I believe she, she took her own life. This is one of the great problems of Catholicism, I'm afraid, is that Catholicism refuses to admit, you know, one of the members commits suicide because obviously that means you won't go to heaven. My brothers to this day, some of them will not accept that my father killed himself. And yet it's blatantly obvious. In the case of my mother, it's a little bit more nuanced. And yet I'm quite certain she did kill herself. I just don't think she had any energy to go on. Um, so I spent then the next three, year, three decades of my life, I suppose, really, um, in an abject and terribly destructive search for healing. Um, I searched through Catholicism. I searched through uh, evangelical fundamental Christianity. I searched through Mormonism. I searched through the Bhagwan Sri uh, Ganeshan, 
determination, what I meant then in Germany, and ultimately through Scientology. Now, I seem to crave the definitive, uh, I, I crave the absolute, I, I crave the unconditional, uh, the unqualified, the black and the white answers to the existential dilemma. I was looking for someone to tell me, essentially. Now, religion was the obvious solution, seems that had laid waste in my childhood. The obvious answer was that I simply was not trying hard enough, so I had to try harder. Um, 30 years later, I suppose, of um, 30 years of, I suppose, with the ignorance ensued actually as a result of that. Really. I suppose the penny dropped in 2006, just after discovering a, the fantastic contract that Hubbard had played on me. Let me just show you something. So there's this picture of Hubbard. Now these are the, um, we're, we're a cult, I don't know, presumably everybody's read something about cults, right? Cults are desperately controlled, manipulative environments, okay? I know there's some arguments for the definition, but, but that is what they are. We are shown this, images like this, of this brilliant L1 Hubbard, this, you know, this, this fantastic philosopher and humanitarian. There he is again in Fitzroy Street in London, you know, that's, again, wonderfully close pictures. Now, I suppose a, a more healthy, per, a skeptical person would say, okay, well, that's very, very close pictures. But to us, as culty, type people, people who are susceptible to culty manipulation, you know, we somehow granted these images much more force than they actually, you know, um, at a certain point, I suppose, I, I found myself in, I found myself in um, Birmingham, in, in uh, Northern England, I suppose, and I happened to be doing some public relations work for the cult, and I'd risen up to a certain point, and I, <coughs> how do I say this, I was infiltrating the social services on behalf of Scientology, in other words, I was trying to get uh, a certain recognition, a certain funding, a certain, I suppose, status for that cult in the city of Birmingham government. Um, when Prescott was uh, the Home Secretary, um, he was, um, he decided to sort of be like, use voluntary organizations. So he started to fund voluntary organizations and give them certain, you know, inputs and so on and formalized it under a body called the VEC, um, Voluntary Something Committee. Um, and I, the idea was that Scientology in Birmingham wanted to start a, wanted to buy, I think it was something like a 25 million building, 25 million pound building. We wanted to, to sort of get in there and get recognized by the state and get some of this funding that the government was giving to voluntary organizations. So I, made my way onto the committee that recommended what charities were allowed to be accepted into, I suppose, this funding um, um, field, you know, or whatever it is. Um, and in doing so, I suppose I had to do quite a lot of work on, in the real world, sort of outside of this kind of rarefied atmosphere of the cult, and I actually had to myself out there into the real world and I actually, in order to build my own profile, I volunteered just as an individual, not as a cult member, but as an individual in a whole bunch of various programs. Uh, there was, uh, there was uh, riots in the Los Angeles in 2004, desperate riots, actually, a number of people stabbed and there was cars burning, you know, the whole, there was a lot of tension between the Afro Caribbean and the Kashmiri Muslim community, and I kind of found myself volunteering within there. And I suppose what happened was that I, it kind of woke me up, because Scientology, the propaganda we received as Scientologists, was that the church is a humanitarian effort, and that our effort is to go out there and to save the planet, these, these huge, all-embracing generalities that were given to us. Um, but nothing is done specifically on, you know, on the ground. So I went out specifically on the ground. Now, admittedly, I was beginning to collect from certain precepts at that point. But I went out and I worked with communities, worked with Muslim youth groups, I worked with 
Afro-Caribbean kids. I worked with, um, it was a refugee, Somali refugee educational programs. And I got in there just, to, just on my own back because I wanted to build my own, partly to build my own reputation, but also partly to interrogate the propaganda I bought for the past 22 years. I was beginning to question it. Um, as a, the result of that was that it was a fantastic con. One of the things I discovered was this picture here of Hubbard. Um, it seems that Hubbard was a drug addict all of his life, despite Scientology's claims to be you know, anti-drugs and sort of this massive program called Narcanon, which has been um, literally spread across the world and gets massive government funding in many, many countries. Um, but it turns out he was, um, I think these, um, he was on Benny's and he was on, on, on uh, all kinds of stuff all his life, really. Anyway, I saw that picture and a couple more pictures, and I really began to ask some questions because, you know, this is the real battle, you know, instead of this beautiful colors. <laughs> um, well, I suppose that um, uh, I finally, there's a very specific piece of, I suppose, is the Scientology theology, if you like, if you like, and it has to do with the fact that the reality of, how, of who we are upon this earth. And I suppose, to simplify that, we are, um, 75 trillion years ago, there was a galactic overlord, who still exists apparently, called Zenu. And Zenu um, decided that he wanted, I don't know, I forget what he wanted, he wanted to tax this galactic confederacy, this confederacy of several planets, right? It's all very believable, I know. <laughs> but, um, Part of this, what he wanted to tax them, and he wanted to reduce its population. So what he ended up doing, he began, everybody had to, all people from these uh, planets had to go along to various centers, and they had to register and pay a tax or something like that. But they were zapped at that point, and they were, the, 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 their bodies were killed, and their beings themselves, in other words, Scientology is, is a dualist, um, out, has a dualist outlook. So there's a spirit and there's a physical body and it separates completely. So the body is sort of rattling around, sorry, the spirit is rattling around inside or outside or around the body or something like that. So Zanu had um, worked out this technology for getting the spirit itself called Theta and putting it into ice cubes and somehow dry freezing them or something. And then they were, curiously enough, this was written in the 1960s, early 60s. Um, they were placed in spaceships that were identical to the then, I think it's a DC-8 airliner. But it didn't use standard, you know, um, you know, props. It used some other jet system or whatever. But this was the design that the, the, these galactic overlords chose for their spaceships. Um, and flew them from all over the galaxy to planet Earth. And, dumped these ice cubes into volcanoes, and he named the volcanoes, and it included Las Palmas, so there were some, some in uh, Hawaii, and some in, oh God, where else? Anyway, he named a, couple, a whole bunch of them in Hawaii, right? But this is, a very, this is a piece of sacred theology, you see? Uh, and then, oh yes, and then they were bombed, and then, so the ice cubes broke, and the spirits escaped into the atmosphere, but then were grabbed into a interrogation kind of a system that they'd set up, and they were implanted with certain images and certain messages. Uh, and these messages included um, Islam, and the belief in Islam, and Christianity, and the belief in Christianity, and various other stuff like that. All of these things that keep them prisoners. And then they were scattered across the earth and they attached, these spirits attached them to the human bodies of primitive man that was running around. And that is the creation story, really, of humankind from Ellen Hubbard's, um, obviously, completely stoned out of his head. <laughs> <laughs> they paid an awful lot of money 
and to learn that story and to receive the various hypnotic implants around that story, in other words, the conditioning, the mental uh, conditioning, which is really a very vicious kind of hypnosis from what I can understand there. Um, you pay, I think it is 35,000 sterling. That's more or less what you pay to receive that level and to become um, what's called an OT3, someone who's enlightened from the story of Zenu, and presumably receives certain additional powers as a spirit. If that doesn't work, well, actually, no, you have to keep going beyond that. Then you have to, there's various levels of this revelation all the way up to what's called OT8 currently. I think OT8, um, in order to get there, will cost you about 100 grand, right? But, you know, there's obviously something quite powerful and quite impactful going on there, right? So that someone would, you know, you'd sell your house, you'd, um, you know, your children's money for university, you'd give it all to church Scientology because you want to receive this level. You want to have this revelation. Um, and people do it, you know. And, and uh, you know, Scientology is going to be called playing that trick. I think it's just that their story is a little bit more bizarre, actually, than, than, than other cults, maybe. maybe that's what it is. The other level is then you have a level of staff member. That's the guys who work in the various Scientology organizations who deliver the Scientology, right? Who, you know, I suppose Scientology is a, what's called a counseling process or an auditing process, right? Where you sit down one-on-one -on -one with a trained counselor with this uh, with the, uh, e meter you probably saw on the poster, this little lie detector machine basically hooked up to that. And this is supposed to detect the voices of these body babies, essentially. It's essentially what it does, right? Um, and there is the Sea Org member. Now the Sea Org member is a person who commits himself to one billion years service to Elder. <laughs> job security. <laughs> um, so obviously it's not this body, this body's going to die after 70 years. So next time you pick up a body, that body, you take your body back to the sea organization. Okay. Um, standing here now, it's quite astounding that I or other intelligent people want this. Now, you know, the, the guys coming to Scientology aren't all kind of wide-eyed, burnt out, Junkies, they're not. There's some very intelligent, able people who get sucked into it and do this. You know, um, just an example. There's a fellow who was head of security at Heathrow Airport. Um, you know, um, that's quite. You know, as you can imagine, that's quite a serious job. But he took his whole. He once once he got hooked into Scientology. Everything. So everything. Four kids, and he brought everybody, kids and everything, into Scientology, into the Sea Organization. So, to describe the Sea Organization, mm. I suppose it's a bit, it's designed along military, military lines. It's actually designed along the Navy. So, so there's certain naval disciplines. Everybody bunks in together. So, in other words, you live in a dorm, right? There's obviously female dorms and various dorms, dormitories. Um, it's a 24-hour day, 365 days a year. The mission, the purpose of Scientology comes before everything else. Nothing else matters beside that mission. Um, I only in 22 years, for instance, I got a total of one span of three weeks leave to go home and see my family. One in 22 years, one span of three weeks. That was it. Right. That's the kind of commitment they ask of you, right? Well, they don't ask you, they tell you, you know, it's all very imperative. You know, this is what you shall do, this is what you shall be, this is how you shall behave, you see? Um, but that's, that's a sea organization, it's a highly controlled environment. It controls your life from, you know, actually, I mean, I mean even when you're sleeping, it more or less controls your life because it's got arms, you know, in some places, armed security guards. Obviously, in more civilized Europe, not where the security guards are unarmed. 
but they do have deafness and stuff like that. So they, you know, you're always under watch, 24 hours a day. You know, um, so it's quite a lot of unhealthy atmosphere to live in, as you can imagine. But as long as we were forwarding the purpose and forwarding the goals and the dream of Scientology to save the planet from It's demise, you know, there was some, again, there was some kind of story given that um, mankind is on a dwindling spiral and, uh, you know, it will dwindle into, I don't know, death sometimes and no spirits will be free. But it's, it's, I'm sorry I'm a bit vague on this, but it's like I've been out for, for, for six years now. Um, and I honestly, I find it so difficult to, to, to put my head back into that place and to understand what I was buying, for, you know, what I was taking in, what I was believing, what I was forwarding. It's, it's quite astounding to me now, you know, and, and that's, the, you know, people change this, I suppose, really. Um, I suppose back onto my prepared script. Um, Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I, uh, I think I probably need the rest of that. The, 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 the thing that happens uh, after I began to realize that what I was forwarding was dangerous. In other words, I'd been working with, uh, with the Somali refugee kids and I was teaching them English, I was teaching them how to use computers and um, they love football, and they straight away they got into the whole football thing. Um, this project, by the way, was supported by um, by Aston Villa Football Club. Um, and that's the only reason I'm not a supporter of Aston Villa. But, uh, um, it was great actually because they set up a little room and they funded it, and all we had to do was to turn up, and it was you know it was very it was, it was a very fine project. Um, and then kids who weren't making it to school were sent along to us, and then. You know, I, I'd volunteer there maybe two, two evenings a week, and, um, and then I'd go over at the Newtown Community Centre with the after school club, and we'd do a little work with, again, little kids who'd be coming in after school, and mothers are still working, and, you know, with various family problems, and, you know, uh, and I suppose what began to dawn on me was that this is the real world, you know, this is nothing to do with Lord Zeno and the spaceships and the volcanoes. <laughs> These are real people trying to live, and, and that's what, you know, I began questioning it, you see. Now, as far as Scientology was concerned, I was a fairly senior exec in the UK um, doing a mission that would result in this desperate longing for recognition, really, for official recognition of Church Scientology in the UK. Um, they've been trying that down the charities line for a long time. And part of my work was to sort of plug into the charity. They got rejected by the UK Charities Commission. And part of my work then was to plug into that to actually do work that could be, you know, followed up on and recognised as valid community work. The Scientology has never, never, never done before. Um, it has its own front groups essentially, which look like they do valid community work and so on, but it's not. It's all it's all completely inwardly focused goes into the Church of Scientology no matter what it does. So if ever you see Scientology volunteer ministers out there during disaster, they're not working at all with anything but to feed their own public relations and to recruit people for their own purposes. Um, quite a few kids actually in Haiti, uh, Scientology went up there in Haiti, there's not sure of this, but it's quite High profile went over there, flew his airplane over there. I'm sure he looked a bit more DCA too. But, uh, you know, but so quite a few kids ended up in the Scientology world, orphans, you know, as a result of this work. And that's not what that kind of work should be doing. That should be there sort of inputting into that that society we build in the fabric of that society, you know. But the Scientologist doesn't understand that. Scientology thinks that by doing Scientology, that's what's going to help the people. 
again, I suppose, not, 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 not like whether it's, um, you know, people who believe in vitamin therapy. I think that the only thing that's going to help a person, that kid, is going to be vitamins or homeopathy or whatever else. You know, it's this kind of non-scientific approach. It's this dangerous, unhealthy approach to what's right for humanity, you know, what's right for us. And what I'll probably do now is I'll just open up the floor for any questions, basically, at this point. I'm sorry it was a bit rambling, but um, I felt that what I typed out there was a bit too formal and a bit too, you know, sort of premeditated, really, which, which isn't really good for this kind of gathering. You know? So, look, if there's any questions about it, ask me anything. I'm completely open. I want to talk about it. So, you know. Have you had any um, problems with Scientology subsequently? Have they tried to uh, harass you in any way? Well, interesting, no. Uh, they, they did initially. Um, <coughs> what, what, when I did that book, <coughs> uh, we put the book up on Amazon. The publisher was Man of Publications. We put the book up on Amazon. Um, we started to move into the UK to get kind of Waterstones and uh, W. H. Smith to start the book. Um, within, funnily enough, even before the book was released, we got reviews from Scientologists, you know, um, who had received, who no one had received the book. You know, Scientologists gave very few reviews of the book. Um, and then Carter Ruck went after us. I don't know if you know who Carter Ruck is. It's, 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 it's one of the most nasty libel firms that were set up basically to make money from pursuing libel cases basically for, for, uh, and it doesn't matter who it is if it's you know um, Milosevic or anybody that they, they would take that and they, they went after us but fortunately in Ireland Scientology is not very popular it's not popular for the legal profession it is not it, it, is, it is viewed you know by judges and by religious and by media as really what it is, a seriously dodgy, dangerous organization. Unfortunately, in the UK, there is much more kind of a moral relativism in play in the, in the structures of power there. There's, um, and Scientology has played on that very, very well. It's certainly lady called Amy Barker Smith, who's a sociologist from the University of London, I guess, already. Um, yeah, and, she, if you like, gives Scientology credibility because she has a certain point of view that the way to engage with these cults is to sort of recognize them on their own values, basically. Um, which is, you know, I can say from my point of view, it's a desperately misinformed view. But she's funded by the government, and if, if there's any problem with Scientology, the British government goes straight to her. She had written their spiel. Um, but she's very, very much in love with, with Scientology population people. But sorry, yeah, that's kind of a good answer. Yeah. Does, that, does that answer? Yeah. It's interesting there that you say that Scientology is frowned upon by the judiciary and by religious organizations in this country as being a dangerous organization. Yes. And by religious organizations. <laughs> 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 yes, of course. Of course. Well, I, I mean, I, I suppose, I mean, I, I mean all, I'm, all I'm talking about there is people who have a voice, you see, you know, I, I mean, most of, a lot of people, we don't have a voice, you see. The religious organization has certain money and certain power that's able to, you know, buy things I don't, I don't necessarily agree with them, um, but they have a voice, you see, they're able to, you know, influence legislation, they're able to influence you know, Scientology came in here and wanted to get whatever the equipment of charitable recognition here, there'd be an awful lot of voices against them, and quite powerful voices, you know. Whereas, I don't know, if I, if I wanted to, I don't know, start up some kind of a, you know, a, a biofuel company here, maybe I'd uh, run up against a lot more resistance. Does that make sense? I'm interested about the structure of the uh, organization which you started telling us about. Yes. But if I followed your story, there are three different layers of mm. groups of people there. I suppose and really, I mean... Could you through, through this and indeed, again, okay. your role I suppose in the organization? Hubbard 
loves his concentric circles and the way he explains an awful lot of things is concentric circles, right? So in other words, um, that's because he he placed himself at the center of everything, right? Um, he was the enlightened one. That was how he positioned himself. Um, he was the receiver of all. Everything actually leads to him, right? And there's various, uh, there's a very defined um, structure of what's called policy. And the policy if you, is, Scientology claims it's a religious scripture. It's not, it's the rules and regulations. It's how to do stuff, Scientology wise, basically. Um, so the core of it then, you could say, was Hubbard. And, uh, and in this day and age, there's a, there's a number of um, uh, chairman of the board, a guy called David Miscavige, um, who learned everything he knows from Ellen Hubbard. He was just a, he was born into Scientology, basically. Um, quite a damaged. So, for, 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 and, and then surrounding him is an organization, a body called RTC, which is the highest ecclesiastical power in Scientology. Surrounding that, then there's, um, and that is based in a, in a, a location that's secret to Scientologists and to other Sea Org members. So that was the, the, the elite organization I was part of, the Sea organization. Um, it's secret to them, but it seems everybody else knows exactly where it is on Google Maps now. <laughs> For as a result, you know, if you're going to be recruited to go, what's called uplands, you know, to, to, to go to the secret base, you know, everybody says, oh my gosh, wow, you've been touched by the hand of God or something like that. Um, and there's, there is, I suppose, really the center of power. So I think that then there's kind of, a, I suppose, a corporate body called the CSI, the Church of Scientology International. And then there's various corporations such as Cosreki, Church of Scientology, um, of Australia and the United Kingdom. There's another corporation called Scientology of Europe and various other ones like that, right? And all these various structures. And these are legal structures, really. They don't, the only difference they really make is the fact that um, they, it means that Scientology kind of is more sensitive to, I suppose, more kind of national differences between, or, or sorry, um, continental differences between America and Australia. Um, everybody, any person who has any power in Scientology is a member of a sea organization. That's um, unfortunately, I, I should have thought about it, but um, sea organization, we, like I like, like to say, people who sign the building year contract, um, and we are structured in kind of a naval fashion. Um, and there's a very strict hierarchy even within the sea organization and with organizations of CEO members. Um, so the UK branch, for instance, is um, much, much lower down than, say, the, um, the international branch based on Hollywood Boulevard. They're all the same CEO members, right? And they're Kotel and Bell and with the goods of the guys who are based up in Hemet. So there's this very, very specific hierarchy power flows down, rules, laws, direction flows downwards. Outside of the sea organization, that was called the staff member. Now, here in Ireland, we've got uh, one organization, one official organization called the Scientology Mission of Dublin. Um, and I suppose the guys who operate those organizations, they live in normal houses. They, you know, maybe get married, have kids, or whatever else. But they pretty much try and work full time in the organization. That's all practical. These organizations don't make a lot of money. And the money they do make, um, I think it's 80% actually goes up lines. It flows up to this, actually flows into accounts in Bermuda, Switzerland, and, and Lichtenstein. It's where the money actually goes. Um, I can decide on that. I, I worked on the, uh, after, for somehow, for some strange reason, the IRS gave Scientology in America uh, a tax exempt status. In other words, it recognized Scientology as a religion, as a as official as Catholicism, as the Baptists or whoever, or Seventh-day Adventists, it was completely. But to do that, we had to run a massive project in order to put all the Scientology, as well as books in order, because there were certain, you know, filings we had to do for the IRS. We had to do that. Um, I was a big computer geek in those days, and so I was um, uh, tasked as part of the team to 
Charlie Jones when we set up this, these, I suppose, really computerized invoicing systems, basically, and uh, financial tracking systems, right? And in that, I found that, you know, sometimes I'd be working in an organization as a CRM member, and sometimes you get three pounds a week pay. You know, literally, that, that's your week's pay. Now, as a CRM member, yes, your essential food and your essential lighting and living is covered, but that three pounds is supposed to cover everything from a new pair of socks to your toothpaste to your, you know, you know things you need to live, right? Um, it's worse for the guys then in the non CO organizations. They were receiving sometimes one pound a week pay, so obviously they had to survive on social welfare while serving psychology. Um, but I did see that so, like, like 25 grand might come into an organization, and all of that, five grand would stay within the organization there. And the 20 grand, through, it's almost like you can imagine, probably it's a very clever system, but the money goes through uh, 10 different accounts. And then all, every, every single week that this happens is what's called a financial planning, and it filters through these accounts and then just disappears at a certain point. And I, had, I suppose, legal responsibility and official responsibility for the money up to the CSI level, Church of Scientology International level. And the money disappeared after that. I mean, literally disappeared. So you can imagine sometimes maybe every, uh, this is done every week, so every week maybe, I don't know, maybe 15 million might come in at some point through these accounts. And each organization is left maybe with a couple of rounds, the rest of that money disappears. It's amazing. Um, we, there, were, there was a guy, a senior executive, while I was in some, when I was in the CR position, was boasting that they purchased a mine, a gold mine, in New Mexico. Uh, in New Mexico. And in that gold mine, what they've done is they've taken all of L1 Hubbard's writings and they engraved them on gold platinum titanium plates and made them into gold. All his blabberings, he'd blabber my god, he'd sit and listen to Hubbard yabbing on for hours and don't do it please, it's bad for your brain. <laughs> um, but you know, he'd yabber on for hours about some little aspect of technology or policy or whatever else, or you know, railing against governments, you know, and whatever else. But all these were put on gold discs. Apparently they were put in this mine, in these kind of earthquake-proof chambers, and we saw pictures of these earthquake-proof chambers that were built on some kind of shock absorbers and all this stuff. And so a lot of money disappeared in that way. Now we were told that to preserve the L1 Hubble's technology in case of a cataclysmic event on Earth, so the technology would be preserved. And you see the gold implant. <laughs> anyway, I mean, that's a very loose description of the structure. One more, if I may, the, the compound in which you were living, where, where was that and how was that? Well, this, yeah, it's also in every, in every on, all, on all the big continents, I mean, there is a, there is what's called, that's what's a compound, uh, but, uh, it is a sea orb base, again, we're using these naval terms, I suppose, really, to create this exclusion. Um, and they're completely, I mean, completely, in the old days, originally when Albert started the sea organization, he bought an old cattle boat and converted it into a floating sea organization management center, right? And they had all kinds of stupid adventures down in Greece and they tried to take over the town and all kinds of mad stuff. But anyway, um, the way they structured it eventually was to set up sea bases on every continent. From, uh, there's, two, there's two in America, east and west, one in Canada and Toronto, one in Sydney, Australia, where I I worked in all of these ones, one in Copenhagen, uh, one in East Grinstead in Sussex, two actually, so you put these two bases there, that's what we know. Um, and uh, one in Russia now, in Moscow, one in Taiwan. And these bases, if you can imagine, it's quite strange because um, you're living there and you're wearing a Navy uniform. And these bases are quite remote from the sea, in many cases. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to have a little bit of difficulty of, like, integrating with the local population. <laughs> and I often, and when you're on project, you have to wear 
what's called the full class A naval uniform. So it's probably the blokes in that boat might, might not even wear the same degree of uniform we wore. So I was, um, at some point, I was a midshipman or something like that. So you're given these gold stripes and gold lanyards and pink caps. And you turn up in Manchester, <laughs> dressed like this. And you go out for a coffee. And, uh, so we just thought, oh, well, the, 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 the sense, I suppose, really, that, that we had was that we are superior to the common man. The common man is what's called a degraded being. And only a very, very small, select few people would actually have the spiritual awareness to plug into Scientology. So we considered people living around us to be what's called degraded beings, and only certain select ones might come to great psychology. So we always had this kind of uh, superiority complex. So anyway, that's, that was how we thought of it. Um, I've got some contact through friends and friends of Scientology, and it's just a question because you've been following them for so long. Yes. Do you think there's a deliberately malicious side to people who become Scientologists and to those higher up the hierarchy? Because there are so many stories of people like yourself, mm. possibly protected from criticism of Scientology as a group, because as I've been told, you're not allowed when you're within the group of the community to access critical information about Scientology. Yeah, there's no internet, no television. And so many people, when they come out of these groups, um, like you've expressed, feel quite shocked at what they've you oh, know, believed and, like I suppose, in a sense, been sold. So reflecting now, do you, do you think that <coughs> those higher, the hierarchy are probably making <coughs> more money, have control, and who yeah. are still involved, obviously Scientology still operates, do you think there was a malicious side to what they're doing, or do they sincerely believe, you know, what they are selling to others you know, and the beliefs that they're, a, they're, they're talking about? It's a really good question. It's a difficult question, too. Um, the majority of us were dupes. You know, um, I, you know, I admit that I, I did an awful lot of therapy when I got out of Scientology. Clearly, I was nothing. Um, and it wasn't me. I didn't go in there because I had some kind of a, you know, um, fascistic point of view. And no one else in my work did. Um, but people who get into Scientology are extremely vulnerable. Uh, when they are recruited, I'm not saying they're necessarily vulnerable to all that, but at the point of recruitment in Scientology, it tends to, you know, go, it's quite a clever little system, but I say people who are very vulnerable, and then it grabs those people. Very, very it's, it's, it's a very clever selection system. So most of the people know there are quite many of the dupes. I mean, my God, it's like if I met the 1985 me who walked into Scientology, I would run him over into psychiatric treatment straight away. You know, <laughs> and, and my God, you know, I'm, I'm terrible. But, um, the upper level guys, it's really difficult. I mean. There's a fellow now called Marty Rathburn and Mike, uh, Mike Rinder. These are two guys who, uh, I suppose, have formed sort of, if you like, a schism from the official Church of Scientology, the Church of Scientology that has the IRS recognition, that owns all these buildings and is investing money in property all over the world. They broke away from it at some point. Now, I'm telling you, when these guys were senior executives, they were nasty, nasty, nasty people. Um, uh, a little example is, you, Look it up online with a certain lady called Lisa McPherson who um, began to cause certain problems with the Scientology. Um, and she had this, curiously enough, a, a, a psychotic break. Scientology is very good at playing with people's minds, right? And um, in that psychotic break, she ran out in the street and threw her clothes off and actually it was, it was a cry for help, right? And the, the local hospital medics picked her up and took her for proper care. And Within minutes, the Scientologists were there. And they said, sorry, no. Um, she, she, she has agreed that only Scientology would treat her mental problems. And they somehow went around and got her back into the depots of Fort Harris in the town. And 17 years later, she was dead. And uh, she was confirmed dead. And, uh, again, oh, 
go and look at pictures, you only, okay, look at pictures online so you get some idea of either misguidedness or blatant of evil. In the, and, and, and I certainly believe that some people are completely misguided because I've done incredibly insane things on behalf of the Church of Scientology. Um, but I was misguided. But if someone died after 17 days in a psychotic state, you know, when she covered in alcohol so much, she was an emaciated, she was a female. Were there any inquest into it? Huh? Were there any kind of inquest into it, or Scientology held to account for any part of this? Um, Scientology initially was, but this is what I'm saying. This fellow Marty Rathbun and Mike Linda, they ran this campaign. And they, and they, the doctor who was testifying, who actually treated, initially treated Lisa, um, for some reason, all of a sudden dropped the case. She was intimidated, she was threatened. You know, this is, you know, it sounds wild. It sounds like the worst kind of story you can hear. But that's what happened. I think David Miscavige was an extremely damaged, dangerous, psychotic individual. Uh, I genuinely believe he's a sociopath. Absolutely. The, the structure of Scientology is structured by L. Ron Hubbard. L. Ron Hubbard, in my book, was a sociopath. I absolutely believe he was. Because the policy creates sociopaths almost. You know, it, it, and it's hard to describe why, but if you consider a belief system that says that everybody who's not in Scientology is a degraded being. And a policy, and I'll give you another example of a policy that we used to um, study all this how to, one of the work we were promoted to executives, you had to completely, almost a better understand this, a better understand this policy, which is called responsibility of leaders. And in that policy, Harvard Law, it's a certain, I don't know if it's a myth, but it's a certain South American uh, dictator who, in order to clean up the lepers in the city, put them all on barges, promised them they were going to this wonderful island, and took the barges out and threw them up in the middle of the river. Now, this was taught to us as good, as a right thing to do. So you can imagine, you know, you go in there, it's a bit open, whatever, you know, I was into that one originally, you know, it's not like, and then you're buying into that kind of thing. So just to follow up, so presumably situations like that, I mean I'm not a doctor, but I started training in medicine. Yes. And you know, there are lots of camps, not just of Scientology, but college groups like this. I mean there is such thing as truth and lies and right and wrong. Yes. And if you're talking about someone whose life potentially could have been saved with the appropriate treatment and she's passed away, I mean is there not a case for not just an inquest, but criminal prosecution over situations yeah, like that. I mean, that's what's the standard. <laughs> and why, why are these people, I mean, could right-thinking people would at that point think this is going too far, presumably. Mm -hmm. So why are these people who may be in this community and organization and initially misguided, and then seeing people defensive of situations to that extreme, which are clearly dangerous, you know why? <laughs> I think it just puzzles me that people are more concerned about Scientology and how it operates. Oh, on the good part of the story, anybody who's anybody who's out of Scientology <laughs> sees it. I mean, within the within the organisation, the information you receive is is utterly controlled. Uh, there, there, there is there is certain confidential things that you do not know. <coughs> if there's any negative story in the press, you are not allowed to buy the papers. Papers are picked up straight away. If anyone's got news, you're not even allowed. Oh God, no. You're actually very, really, it's very difficult to hold the newspapers. If there's anything on television, well, actually, the Sea Org is not allowed to have television. It's not on the Sea Org, not allowed to have television. Um, the radio is yes, but um, you know, you, you obviously, when you're working, you work most of the day, you work from um, 8 o'clock in the morning to about 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the morning, basically. That's your working day, basically. Not a lot of time to sit around listening to the radio, you know. Um, internet apps, verboten, forget it. Because I think they, we, we, we set up, I work for some of the guys, and we set up what's called an intranet. In other words, so, so though there's one feed to the internet, and that's in Los Angeles. And then everything else, you know, until whatever they want you to receive, you know, on your message system, your intranet message system. 
So I mean, it's very, it's very controlled in that respect. I don't know how. I, I don't know how I would have reacted. It's an interesting question. How would have I re reacted as a CEO member, full blown CEO member, if I had come across a Lisa McPherson case, which I've never known before? I hate to admit it. I, I admit it. I'm desperately ashamed to admit it. I would have brushed it off. Mm -hmm. I would have thought she was a <laughs> demon. She was. I'm uh, sorry, I'm a degraded being. This kind oh, of right. this lower life form. I hate to say that, but my God, I, I think I would have. Based on stuff that I did, based on stuff that I was you know, encouraged. <laughs> Obviously, I wasn't there. The, 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 this, the, this, this 2000, 2008, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Jet's wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Jet autistic. Scientology does not admit these kind of um, congenital conditions. It, it doesn't admit it. It says that any problem, because Scientology believes, right, that the, the, the brain is the brain is nothing. The brain is just a series of circuits, relay points. That's that's what Hubbard teaches in Scientology by the solve this thing, right? Um, so autism and conditions like that wouldn't be recognized, you see. But the child was obviously, you know, I mean, from the get-go, he was obviously a severely damaged child. Scientology is anti-psychiatry. Um, the, the pictures we were painted of psychiatry, again, it's a bit of a control mechanism for the person within the form of Scientology, that the evil world outside is controlled by these evil psychiatrists who are going to electric shock you when lobotomize you, that's what they're going to do, you know. Again, we buy that because that's kind of the atmosphere we live in. Um, so rather than allowing any enlightenment from a psychiatric point of view, um, they decided that they would use certain vitamin therapies. So uh, at some point, I, I, as far as I understand the story, at some point he had been prescribed some kind of an anti Seizures as well. I mean, it's something like that. But then the Scientology guide said to him, said to Travolta, You're not allowed to do that, you're not allowed to do that, so he went back into physical therapy. And he's still a Scientologist. Travolta. Good question. I mean, my God, this for the National Enquirer, he's in a lot of trouble at the moment. He's, <laughs> uh, you know, he's not explicit about it. Kelly Preston, I, I did read the Kelly Preston, his wife. His kind of his stepford wife kind of said that um, she's living in. Um, uh, John is uh, John Travolta. I'm sorry, I've met gay people and uh, uh, she's gay. <laughs> The aspect of protecting people, um, I think it's a, an absolute necessity in any open society that you have to allow people to make their own mistakes. Now, to what extent can you protect people then against cults like Scientology? Now, I think you got to the, the heart of it there, charitable status. I think there's a prima facie argument in all democracies to have a long, hard look at charitable status as, as regards all religions, not yeah. just cults like Scientology, which are more obvious. And the question is, why should you have charitable status anyway? What are you actually doing to, you know, to be rewarded? Well, see, that's in trouble. I mean, in England, it's England. England has a charitable as do we, you know? Uh, I suppose, yeah, Ireland. As do we, as, 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 as almost all open societies and democracies. Well, it's not that America uses a religious recognition as well. They've got a dual thing. Yeah. Um, the curious thing is, I mean, look, what I puzzle over is that the, the, the cults seem to emanate mm. from America. Mm. So what is it about America that germinates this kind of thing? Um, but then I don't know if you can go, I've not analyzed them in great depth, but there's a wonderful film, uh, what's the name, um, Tiki, 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 Jason Tiki, uh, that wonderful film on documentary of the fuel. He's talking about the big oil thing, basically. Yeah. Wonderful documentary, you know, and you can see that there is clearly a collusion, you know, 
people who have money buy what they want in America. They sell them on food. They do so Scientology pays. They've got some of the top lobbyists mm -hmm. in Washington and in London too, but they really, really pay. They pay a lot of money. But outside of the religious aspect, if you say you know, the charitable status is mm -hmm. dependent on, say, for example, training or some sort of um, socially useful right. function, what then? Can we look at that? What is legitimately training? You know, as you said, it's the training is self-focused. If um, Scientology apparently has these training schemes, they're going to take all these unemployed or unskilled kids and train them at something. If that self-focused back into the organisation as as a means of just acquiring people who suck up more money, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. how legitimate is that? Again, it's a, it's, it's, it's a nightmare. Yeah. But to me, it really is because I can see what's happening. You know, yeah. I've been in there, and I get I get called an apostate. Yeah. You know, they say, "Oh God, you know, how can you possibly?" You're obviously bitter and twisted and hateful. Mm. You know what I mean? I do, but um, I mean, but the, the 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 thing is that money talks, right? And Scientology has an awful lot of money. They they, they do. Mm. They're, they're very very good at making money, keeping money, using money, basically. Um, I'll tell you how clever they are, actually. But anyway. I don't know if I, I think I've covered it in the book. But, but I was, I, um, we had a legal situation in, uh, down in uh, Dorset, in that area. Um, and at that time I was a, a chief executive over a certain area that had to do with this organization. Um, Scientology was very good at kind of, if you like, sort of creating these kind of, I suppose, um, what would you call them, um, I suppose buffer zones between the central power and the guilty party out there in the field, basically, right? Well, in this case, this person got sued, sued us for a million sterling, basically, right? Uh, and if the money wasn't paid, they would come to a case, the point in the court case, where right? if Scientology didn't, so Scientology lost the case, we didn't pay the money, um, it would close, so we close down Cosraki, which was Scientology, Religious Education College International, uh, in the United Kingdom. That's what we did, right? So rather than the, than the very senior executives over that area, directly over that area, and sort of in the broad responsibility, I was the one in charge of Southern India or whatever it was. And so they said, okay, you go down there and you solve it. Right? I had to go down there and find a million quid, basically. Right? Um, during that period, it took six months to do it. Right? Um, on average, I had five quid in my pocket a week, basically. And I worked from... I, I used I don't know, I don't know when I slept, I slept maybe two or three hours a night for six months. Mm -hmm. And we made sick, we made a million quid and we got that enough. But by God, when I got back to the headquarters, I changed at that point. So you money. had to find the money in order to pay off this award, quite totally outside of the church? Oh. Should you know, we know, the way you get the money is you fool a lot more people into giving In Germany, the, when you pay your tax, yeah. uh, federal tax, there's a very small uh, section of tax, and basically that goes to pay the wages of all established religions. Right. And I think they have a formal listing, and obviously all the Lutheran churches, Roman Catholics, yes. and probably yes. Catholics yes. as well. Yes. There's, That's a, right. there's a formal list. Now, I know that the, um, now I don't know how they deal with cults, you know, and modern cults, shall we say. But, uh, I mean, in my view, even that's ethically suspect. You know, why, um, you can get out of it. It's quite difficult, but you can actually exercise your rights. Yeah, I remember, no, I remember when I was in Germany, I, I didn't want to pay tax, yeah. and I was able to opt out. Yeah. Scientology, is, Germany is the one country in the world that's, the, that's got Scientology assessed. Yes. It says Scientology, the things that's been, that's what the government, the official statement with regard to Scientology in Germany is Ponza Sweden. It's the only country in the world that has a certain bureau just to watch Scientology. <laughs> so they're very, very, very smart. But um, um, the curious thing is that there was a number of um, there was a number of high very high profile cases going on in Germany against Scientology. Um, and Clinton was lobbied. Um, the, the US State Department and the US whether they were foreign people who were foreign went to Germany and they complained to the call at that time that they back off from Scientology. But they did. It seems to me the whole, you know, to not to labour the point, but the charitable aspect.
aspect seems to me a massive absurdity in this society. Oh if um, a brother or a sibling um, gives, I think the limit is 50,000 euros, right? Yeah. Thereafter it's taxed, right. brother to brother, brother to sister. You know, right. we have inheritance taxes and they yes. vary obviously with the circumstances and the economy, they're higher now than they were a few years ago. And the likelihood is they'll be higher in the future. Right. They're all taxed. I mean, put another way, if I decided to move to America, I would certainly consider starting a religion. It's good oh, business. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's very good business. Brilliant business. <laughs> against, you know, religion, you know, 
as I was when I was religious, you know, I was fighting against the atheists or whatever, back then it was sword held high, and I became this kind of evangelical anti-Christian, anti-religious person. Um, I think in the last year or so, I, I, I've begun to sort of, I suppose, really try to be a bit more kinder, if you like, to, to in other words, to, 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 to be able to see, okay, even the people who are being Scientologists, I mean, this guy is talking about Matty Rathburn. Matty Rathburn, he terrifies me, not because of him, but because of what he is doing. He took his whole Scientology training and took it out of the official thing and started his own little cult of Scientology there. Now, I've got some really good friends who like him and say he's a wonderful guy. So, and he's actually helped a really good friend of mine's daughter from committing suicide, and he helps her to, to, to you know, get over a suicide litigation. I said, you know, I can't say that's bad. I think it's frightening that he would still promote Scientology technology despite everything he's been through. But despite everything he's done with Scientology, because he was very instrumental in the recent Wilson case, you know, in covering it up and buying off the judges and whatever else he was doing. But at some point, you know, at some point, I need to stop fighting. You know, I need to stop fighting them on an emotional level and try and look at the. I, I will never forgive Scientology corporately. I will never forgive that body. I will never forgive Hubbard actually as the one guy that no time for whatsoever on this end. But the people who are Scientologists, maybe. I got out when I was fanatic. Oh God, I was fanatic for me, and more so. That's, I can't answer it specifically. It's it's just question, it's that place yeah. along the do, do you yourself try to get these, try to go, say, hang on a second, try to talk to people in Scientology and try to get them out? Well, Scientologists won't talk to me because I'm a declared SP and I won't talk to you. you know there are Scientologists, do you try to sit there and say, look, come on, this is all this Last time I tried that, they were just screaming at me. <laughs> <laughs> the guys who just get out who still believe in Scientology, you know, I will talk to them and I'll try and lose some of them, you know. Often just in terms of the flame wars on the terrible thing. Sorry. Um, just to talk just a little bit on um, your life previous to that. The people that I've been involved with in my work um, have been on mental health issues, uh, they've been with mental health problems, and the people who I find who have been recruited into cults, not just Scientology but other cults, yeah. seem that because they've not been there all their lives some way of being rescued or internally they can rescue themselves out of what they've come if they've decided to change their mind. The people that I find really difficult to talk to or to uh, be with are the children of the cults who have been born into this completely enclosed world because uh, unless you've met them and spoken to them, they truly do believe every cell of their body what they've been told. It's it very difficult to get through with them that, that, it, that it is a dangerous thing that they've been born into it. And on a mental health issue, it's frightening to have people come in and have that attitude. I think it was all for Catholics, all for Santa No, it's very different. I would say it's very it is, yes. It's a very different world from what we've been brought up into. If, if you look at it, I mean, my son was on talks of child psychology, you know, as the brain develops. And, uh, it's obviously the child's brain is stimulated by, by kind of an enriched environment, isn't it? And so a healthy child has a very enriched but environment. But they do truly believe that they're chosen, that with every cell of their body, there's no, a lot of the time, there's absolutely no room for movement. They are chosen to do this, and as you said, they're, they're superior, and they truly do. Yes. Children yeah, of the cards. Cells believe that. Yeah. yeah. No, they have had no choice. Well, exactly. Well, it was interesting. It's a very interesting point because because it was a uh, Miscavige, David Miscavige guy, who's sort of right up there at the very very top. Um, <laughs> that I suppose that tranche of children of, of that first um, first second generation children, really, they're the ones who floated up to the top of Scientology. They're the ones who run it. They're the ones who are convinced. Um, now, the reason, well, if we're going back onto something else on that, by the way, is that um, I suppose one of the things I found shocking when I was doing my financial work. Um, I did see David Miscavige's payroll records, um, and officially it was 60 grand a year, 
right? Now, we were on, I, I, I worked, I think I, I worked out my payroll for a year, for years, 2000, you know, and on top of that, the state of gets, um, they buy him a Range Rover a year, they buy him a BMW and buy, they buy him, you know, a bulletproof GMC, and, you know, the rest of the hands out to Tom Cruise, it's quite important, because he's a happy spank to do but, but, but he's one of those children of the con, he's one of those people that made it to the top like that. Um, the, a lot of the people I know, a lot of the kids who've gotten out of some college, you know, people who grew up in the atmosphere, maybe there, there's something breaking down maybe with the conditioning, because this is a very, this, it's very structured, if you like, programming is the best way to say it. You're programming the child's mind basically from the start. Um, there's a belief system in the Scientology study technology, which is actually desperately bad because the kids are terribly illiterate once they come out of the Scientology educational system. Um, but the kids believe that they are super literate. I've heard someone saying to me once, he said, what did he say? He said that he was the most literate man in Ireland as a result of Scientology crisis. And I said, share the CD, and he's like, who's sharing the CD? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but yeah, no, no, but, but, but people who have gotten out, uh, I have known a lot of the kids, first generation, second generation kids who've gotten out basically. They're very uh, devils though. Oh God, they are. I mean, but also, I mean, of course, the way Scientology treats them doesn't help either. I mean, in, in, in other words, if you want to an awful anecdotal story, again, just, no, just, just I know he's going to tell the story. It's not because, you know, uh, I'm trying to damn, make people, Know, go up there with axes and start cutting some of those pieces, but, uh, but, but just to give an idea of, of, of the thing, of how they look at the human being, how they look at the person. Um, it's a really good friend of mine uh, called Louise, and her sister, back in 19, I'm trying to remember when it was, I think it was 1990, 1991, 1992, her little sister, Mia, who was at that time 40, yeah, um, disappeared. Well, this is from the Scientology base, right? Uh, now, I, I had to go off, uh, I knew, I, I'd done a little bit of work with the kids, you know, um, kids work, kids are part of the production machine there basically, um, and I was always good with kids, so I used to run the kids in certain production programs, so Mia disappeared one day, right? I had to go off to Africa on a project in America, so I didn't get back for a few years, and then by the time I got back, Louise was gone, oh, right, uh, um, but, but the parents, were still there, and we, so, so these girls were gone, but the parents were still there, and serial members, right? Um, after I got out of Scientology a couple of years ago, I found Louise on Facebook, and we had this wonderful thing to get there with good friends, and I asked her to me, and she gave me a whole story of Mia. Mia had been, you know, I'm sure everybody who's got kids know what a 14-year-old girl can be like, you know, they're, they're wonderful kids, but you know, they can be a bit hormones everywhere, and there's all kinds of fun going on. Well, Mia was reacting very strongly against, you know, different things that were happening within the cult, uh, because the kids had been brought in, the families were another family unit that had been recruited, and so the parents had taken the whole family, plonked into Church of Scientology, into the sea organization, away from their friends, into this crazy, awful atmosphere, uh, I don't want to describe it anymore, but um, Mia was causing a lot of trouble, so what they did was, they said, okay, so they took her mother, and they sat the mother down in the security office, and they took Mia, and they sat Mia down there to me. And they said, Mia is a suppressive person, right? And a suppressive person is persona non grata, is a person who cannot be salvaged, basically, if you send to work in And a person who's a troublemaker for Scientology. And they said, okay, um, Mia has to leave now, at this minute, and Paula, so mother, said, Paula, you can go with her and look after her and get her to school, or, better do it because she's a suppressive person, is not destroying your CEO in Korea. You carry on and we'll get rid of Mia. The mother chose that option and she carried on in the CEO organization. And Mia was taken, I talked to Mia extensively afterwards, uh, just again a couple of years ago. And Mia was taken to the East Quincy train station. She gave 40 quid. And she was on the train to Malibu. 14 year old child. And told never, ever, ever to come back. She, she survived, I mean, everybody, she, she prostituted herself, went to nightclubs and picked up guys and girls and slept with them and 
stuff for you know, and stuff to do for them, all this kind of stuff, 14 months old. You know, and she was a drug addict from one moment. His family was able to get out of the whole horrible Scientology world, he rescued her and get her out of the streets and get her into something to be you know. Uh, same happened to her sister. She was let out from the streets in Los Angeles. Children, you know, uh, and there's an awful people like that. So, because Scientology, the concept of a, it's not such a thing as a child in Scientology, it's an adult with a small body. That's what Harvey preaches. Because it doesn't because remember, it doesn't recognize neurology, it doesn't recognize you know the, the, the brain, it doesn't recognize this whole you know scientific understanding that we have now of how the how people grow. And so it's so it's obviously a bad adult in a small body, so out, gone. What do you do? So can I just ask you you mentioning John Schwartz and there is mm -hmm. why do you think so many celebrities are sort of drawn in and like you said there people are tend to be moved when they're vulnerable. Yeah. Or included when they're vulnerable. So would they be moved to kind of give it a certain glamour or you know It's interesting. I mean I mean I mean look the Scientology is the only cult that I am aware of that set up a specific recruitment center in Los Angeles, right there in Hollywood Common yeah. and spent millions purely focused to get the celebrities. Hubbard made a list actually, I've seen the list of, of whatever it was, I suppose he made a list in 1971 or two, whenever it was. So he made a list of whoever the big stars were, they would get him, 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 right? yeah. and, and they got someone. They, they did. They got and someone. it's a case that they're kind of, are they surrounded by minders or whatever that keeps them apart from, you know, Joe Public so that they're not exposed to too much criticism or? Well, I mean, the Sargon. I mean, Tom Cruise isn't really a great See, the thing is, the, 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 <laughs> You have to understand Scientology um, very rapidly separates the individual from the real world, I mean, from, from his friends, contacts, you know. Um, and that, actually, the, the, the process that Cruz went through was not that different to mine, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, when, I, when I look at it. Although he was, uh, Minnie Rogers, I think, was what was Scientology, she was sent to recruit him, basically. Oh, okay. Uh, yes. Apparently, now the, the story is. Uh, Sorry, uh, his first wife. Mimi Rogers. Yeah. Mimi Rogers' first, first wife, that's yeah. right, yeah. That's yeah. 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 um, the, 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 There's an interesting interview with Tom Cruise from just after he did uh, whatever that what was, that dancing thing he did. Um, it's all perfect. Huh? Nitro. Yeah. Risky Business? Yeah, that was it. Yeah, yeah. Well, was it the first one he was sliding yeah. in? Yeah, sorry, that. Yeah. Right, but, but that's when he became famous. But that's when he was involved with Mimi Rogers, so. So she, it's through her Yeah. And he was desperately vulnerable. Yes, he was saying, yeah. And then, I mean, um, obviously, you know, they wouldn't be doing grown work. <laughs> Sorry, within mm -hmm. the organization. I mean, what level are they kept at? Well, I mean, they obviously kept an exclusive treatment. Yes. Yeah. It's a celebrity center, which is very different from the other one. Um, there's an awful lot more people handling it than there is other ones. Um, it's, it's amazing. It's quite shocking, actually, to think about it. I mean, I mean, it's a complete world built around um, um, these people. Um, who's that the one I was thinking of? Um, oh, God, what's her name? Ah, well, Nancy Chapman is a big example of that, right? Yeah, really hurt. Yeah. Oh, it's awful, isn't well, it? Well, I found out she was the voice of that. She was a Scientologist. Yeah, the voice of the symphony. Yeah, she is. But listen, oh, that's that's the listen. That's a
jury is settled. So, 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 yes. so Ricky Gervais was correct. Oh, so probably so made the dig about. What? <laughs> Last year he made some dig about Dutch Bolt and Tom Cruise. And some joke about them being gay or something like that, and there was this really uncomfortable as a fire. Did you see, if you look at their careers and analyze them, uh, Cruz in particular, he had an appeal, this sort of action. All appeal. American. So he had this profile yes. of, you know, mm. you know, his target sort of audience, yeah. his boys, adolescent boys up until their 20s, who are probably not going to be that comfortable yes. idolizing a gay star. Right. Came right. Out. So, right. so if you look at the, the wives, allegedly. Oh, <laughs> she's like a step for Yeah, exactly. Well, well, you can through them, I mean, and Nicole Kidman was an Aspen, a very, very good actress. Yeah. Amazing actress, but an Aspen Australian actress. Yes. It didn't she, hurt her career yeah. to be attached to, to this very, very big star. She and if anything, it gave her a huge amount of profile, but she had to sacrifice. Yes, but know. she obviously had no time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Kenny Holmes was an arranged marriage. I know she yeah. was recruited. I heard something like he, yeah. he auditioned various actresses yeah. that would fit the profile yeah. of what they wanted and his wife. And then, so, the, so I presume so Sori is being brought up in the same. She, she's the superior being, so she's the champion. Yes. At this point, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> At this point, I don't know. But, it was, but, but sorry, I'll just give you one uh, couple of uh, cruise anecdotes, which is really interesting. Cause, cause, uh, in 19, when he met Nicole, that wasn't planned, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they, they were a few days of wonder together, right? Um, she, her, dad's, her dad is a psychologist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the end of the, 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 the evil Satan, as far as I'm talking mm -hmm. so. But, so I think they worked very hard on that relationship to destroy mm -hmm. it. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, during his relationship with, with Nicole Kidman, he was out of Scientology for quite a few years. Mm -hmm. And that's when he did um, a number of films. Uh, what was that film? Far and Away here. Far and, well, Far and Away yeah. here. Scientology. <laughs> 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 Not Far and Away. Yeah. 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 No, what was that one then? Oh, God. The, uh, uh, um, oh, I'm so stupid. Did you hear the vampire? Huh? Top Gun? Did you hear the vampire? No, 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 that very sexually explicit. Oh, oh Eyes Wide Shut. Eyes Wide Shut, that one there, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, with Kubrick, yeah, that yeah. was it. Yeah. So, I, 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 and Miscavige counted, the, 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 what I heard was Miscavige said, that's out ethics, again, that's a sign, that's a pejorative term in Scientology. Yeah. And that was when that whole relationship was broken up. Oh, yeah. That's what that's done together. Yeah, yeah. they got crews up to the uh, Hemet base, uh, which is quite a plush bit of it there. Um, and he was run up through to OT3, this level I was talking about later, and he had a mental breakdown. Um, just to give you an idea of what, what, what an awful lot of people have mental breakdowns in OT3, and these are terrible mental breakdowns of these folks. Um, I, I had to look after people, because again, Scientology is being in, in psychiatry. Mm -hmm. So if someone has a breakdown, yeah. they have to be separated and then completely isolated and looked after until they quote come out of it, right? I, I did them a couple of reasons. I mean, it's horrible. It's, 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 but but, but the, the process of doing one, two, three causes a lot of people to mentally break down. Mm -hmm. Funny enough, a lot of them come out of it are much more dedicated psychologists. Right. That's what's getting it's kind of really different. Yeah. 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 yeah, and that's how I experienced that myself. And my other days, it's like, oh, I did break down. It was terrible. Then I came out, and this was, this was the answer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is just personal interest because I am interested in listening to that and not often. Um, it sounds like you're very, in a very protected, kind of isolated um, community or group right. when you're in Scientology, even if you're not physically isolated from other people. So, Thank you, um, you must, I mean, people within Scientology must get unwell and have health issues like everyone else does in the whole wide world. So, do you, are there kind of Scientologists, Scientology appointed doctors? Or do they, because you're saying that Scientology is, on the whole is quite um, negative about psychiatry. Oh, as medicine, medicine. Medicine is so in terms of medicine, you know, asthma, heart conditions, and everything that yeah. unfortunately happens to so many people, do they just attend um, normal general practitioners and physicians within hospitals? And I mean, or do they have their own? They tend to try to have normal doctors, yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they do, I mean, in many cases, do in Los Angeles as well, right, what doctor then? A lot of the solutions to problems you throw down bunches of these vitamins, I don't know if you've heard the Scientology rehab system, it's called purification one down, um, a group called Narcanon ones, it's supposed to be a, a 
or psychiatry free, uh, drug free, um, what we call detox. That's what it's supposed to be. That's pretty dangerous stuff. You, you don't even, if you know about, I don't know how to know about niacin. How much niacin is it safe to take? How much beef is it safe to take? You know, they, they keep on increasing these loads all the time until this positive state of cleanliness is reached. So well, really, very, 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 very important. Uh, a lot of Scientologists get, uh, well, a lot of people get cancer, but in Scientologists, it's very, very, the number of people who do not have the cancer recognize it quite late because they make every other reason for the illness or the symptoms except the medical condition because they refuse, there is a refusal, okay, policy wise. To allow the person to recognize the cancer is because of whatever genetic condition you have, it could be else. It has to do with the spiritual condition, which has to do with the sex and problems with, to do with sex and relationships. That's why you get cancer. Not smoking, smoking's good cancer. <laughs> you, 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 you're so ill, there are people who smoke, and you might not, even now, in this day and age. So uh, so I'm sorry, it's crazy. So but, a woman but, developed breast cancer in the Scientology community. Not only would she not be encouraged to seek help, but if she was diagnosed with it, she'd be told that it's most likely because she's had sex with lots of people. Is that what you're kind of saying? <laughs> well, <they're not laughs> it, 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 it sounds the same, but listen, I, I mean, we have two really, pretty, two, two, two women who really close friends of mine within the Scientology. They both suddenly got, well, suddenly got cancer. Of course, no one suddenly gets cancer, you know, the symptoms from, I don't know, what stage. But both of them were dead within six months of the diagnosis and the doctor saying, oh, you know, but at some point you have to, you know, there has to be medical intervention. You get people dying lying around the grounds of saying, oh, dead, and they can't do that, so it's not very good for the relations. <laughs> there, are, there are cases, you'd see one or two per year out here in Ireland or somewhere else around the world where a couple that would have believed in some alternative medicine are yes, taking some yeah. account afterwards and generally have got So I and I've yet and I've never seen it, you know, because for me what you've just discussed there about the cancers and all the other stuff that happens in Scientology that something like this hasn't come out and exposed Scientology for what you know, there's lots of things that are exposing Scientology for what it is and they're Australian government they're down the top of Australia and it's not but there hasn't been a single case that I'm aware of. Dead people don't talk. I hate to think like dead people don't talk. So it's a few treatments that that's you know, the diagnosis is made so late. I was terrified they did the cult. I was genuinely terrified. I thought the psychiatrist who made it everything. It was only because I had a little bit of a business and work on the actual on the real on the real world was voluntary work. But I was still scared, you know, I was scared of a lot of people. You you said earlier on that it took you five years to, to come out. Yes. Uh, presumably there was a moment when you said, that's it, I'm out. Remember that? Do you what mean what the final moment? The final moment. And oh, what yeah. triggered it? And what triggered it? Yeah, well, pretty much fascinating, actually. Uh, uh, again, um, the internet is your friend. That's kind of <laughs> Google is your friend. Um, I was, um, because I was running this project, and for very unusual, for a set member, I was working quite independently on this, and, you know, because progress I was making and they're all thrilled, you know, of the international oh, well done, this is great, and whatever else. But um, there was a number of pressures. One pressure was that I was being promoted up to the um, the international place in Hemp that I described as right. Um, I because I worked at that level before, there's nothing that I've played at that level before, I had a fair idea of what it was like there. 